everybody! I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be discussing diuretics. So the first group of diuretics we're going to talk about are loop diuretics. And they're called that because that's where they work in the body. So they work in the ascending loop of Henle, so that's why they're called loop diuretics. What they do is they block sodium and chloride, which will then prevent water reabsorption. And then they cause extensive diuresis. So if your patient is on a loop diuretic, they're peeing, they're urinating all of the time. Okay, So it makes them urinate quite frequently. So the thing about loop diuretics is they work, and sometimes they work a little too well, and when they work a little too well, it can cause some problems, some complications. So some adverse effects of loop diuretics include dehydration, and that makes sense, right? Because if you're peeing all the time, right, maybe a little too much, right? And it can cause you to be dehydrated. That can also throw off all of your electrolytes. So you can have hyponatremia, hypochloremia, hypokalemia, decreased calcium, decreased magnesium, all of those things, all of those electrolytes can be thrown off because of all the diuresis, so going to the bathroom so much. It can also cause hypotension, so a, a decrease in your blood pressure. Some of these are autotoxic, especially when taken with other autotoxic meds. So what does that mean? It means it can cause ringing in the ears or loss of ability to hear. And then the other thing is we have to be very careful if our patient has diabetes and is on a loop diuretic because it can cause hyperglycemia. So it can increase their blood sugar to a dangerous amount. So we have to be very, very careful if our patient is a diabetic. Our nursing interventions for people on loop diuretics include monitoring their lab values, especially the electrolytes. So we talked over here in the adverse effects about all of the electrolytes that get affected. We definitely want to monitor those values and make sure that they're in a safe, normal range. Vital signs, especially blood pressure, because again, it can cause dangerous hypotension. Their I and O, because of course, they're going to have lots of output with this med. We're going to want to educate them about increasing the amount of potassium in their diet because it does cause hypokalemia, so getting rid of too much potassium. So we want to make sure that they're supplementing that potassium, hopefully in their diet. If not, then we'll have to supplement it, you know, with medicine. Monitoring their blood sugar levels, especially if they're a diabetic, because we don't want them to have too high blood sugar. We don't want hyperglycemia to occur in these patients. And then, of course, we're going to do our normal head-to-toe assessment just like we would on anybody else, but special things to look for when we do that assessment. The patient's weight, and they should be weighed at the same time every single day. If they report any symptoms like headaches or dizziness, that could be related to the um, hypokalemia and then the low blood pressure. These patients are again at risk for postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. So when your blood pressure drops, when you get from like a sitting to a standing position and you have risks for falls that way. So very important that we ask, do you have any dizziness or lightheadedness? Tinnitus, that's the ringing in the ears. So that's our autotoxicity. Their skin turgor, because we're checking their dehydration to make sure that they are not dehydrated. Edema, so swelling anywhere in the body, okay, in the feet, in the hands, in the face. And then muscle twitching. If we get a little too messed up here with our uh, electrolyte imbalances, it can cause severe uh, CNS-like uh, symptoms. And we start noticing that with like twitches and tremors and things like that. And that's bad. We don't want that. Some special things I wanted to point out as well for their nursing interventions is this is not a medication we want to give right before bedtime. Why? Because it makes them pee a lot, okay? So they're getting up to use the bathroom frequently. This is not something you want to give them right before they go to bed because they're going to be up all night doing that. And then some special considerations with this medication. If you use it with digoxin, there is the potential to cause a dysrhythmia. If you use it and your patient is already on a different antihypertensive, like a beta blocker or something like that, it can make it even more severe so they can become hypotensive. 
And then if they're using NSAIDs along with this medication, that NSAIDs could decrease the effectiveness of your loop diuretic. And then here I just wrote some examples of some commonly used loop diuretics. I think probably the most famous one is furosemide Lasix, but Bumex is another one commonly used loop diuretic. Now let's move on and talk about thiazide diuretics. Okay, now let's talk about thiazide diuretics. And you're gonna notice a little theme. They do pretty much the same thing loop diuretics do, but they don't act in the same location in the body, which is a little bit better. This is a little bit of a safer location in the body. So remember the loop diuretics acted in the loop of Henle. The thiazide diuretics will act in the early distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so we're moving a little bit further along in our anatomy. They're gonna do the same things. They're gonna block reabsorption of sodium and chloride, which will block water reabsorption, and then they will promote diuresis, so getting the patient to urinate a lot. A lot of the adverse effects. Now, you'll note these look similar to the loop diuretics, but there's a lot less of them, right? So these are actually considered a little bit safer than the loop diuretics. Dehydration, again, because you're going to the bathroom a lot. Decreased potassium right, because potassium is being lost. And then they are still at risk for hyperglycemia. So again, if your patient is a diabetic, we need to keep an eye on that. And just like the loop diuretics, we don't wanna give these before bed because they're gonna be up going to the bathroom all night. Some other nursing interventions. We're gonna monitor their labs, especially in this case, potassium. We're gonna encourage them to have a diet high in potassium. Monitoring their vital signs. A lot of times thiazide diuretics are used for blood pressure issues. So if the idea is to use this to make their blood pressure go down and we check their vitals and we're seeing their blood pressure is going down, then that's a good thing. It means that they're working and they're doing their job. We're gonna monitor the patient's weight because they could lose weight by using this medication. I and O. And then of course, blood sugars, especially on our diabetics. Some commonly used one, I think hydrochlorothiazide is the most commonly used one you will see, but there are some other examples. And then I do wanna say something special about thiazide diuretics is that they are the first choice diuretic when it comes to treating hypertension. So if your patient has hypertension and they are going to be put on a diuretic because of it, it's probably going to be a thiazide diuretic. It's probably going to be hydrochlorothiazide because it's pretty common. So we just talked about loop and we just talked about thiazide. You notice they have something in common when it comes to potassium, right? So this next group of diuretics are called potassium sparing diuretics. Now let's talk about potassium sparing diuretics. These ones are a little bit different. So what they do is they block aldosterone, which if you remember back from A&P, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So they block the action of aldosterone, which then causes potassium retention and then sodium and water secretion by the body. The big number one adverse effect that we care about with potassium sparing diuretics is hyperkalemia. Because if you remember, the other two, the loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics, they can't wait to get rid of that potassium, right? They're getting rid of it so fast. This one, its job is to not do that, right? And because its job doesn't do that, we have a risk for having too much potassium in the body. Patients who are already on ACE inhibitors or potassium supplements should not get potassium sparing diuretics because that increases their risk of hyperkalemia. Our nursing interventions for these patients include, of course, the big one, monitoring their potassium levels and making sure that they're in a normal range, not too high. Avoiding diets high in potassium. So the other two, we wanted to encourage them to eat it. With this group, we're gonna encourage them to not eat potassium. And this, of course, includes salt substitutes. So a lot of times people who are in heart failure, people who have CHF, they are given um, certain like dietary restrictions and they're said, oh, here, go try this salt substitute instead of using you know, regular salt, right? So those people need to be careful if they're also gonna be on a potassium sparing diuretic because those salt substitutes contain potassium. 
So important patient teaching there. Of course, we're going to monitor their blood pressure. And then certain uh, types of potassium sparing diuretics, I put two examples here um, of the most like commonly prescribed one. Certain types can actually cause the urine to turn blue. So that's a little bit freaky for the patients. That would scare them. So very good patient teaching is required if they're going to be on that medication. And then the last thing I wanted to point out that's important about potassium sparing diuretics is they are very rarely used all by themselves. Most often they were used in conjunction with another diuretic. So often used with other diuretics, loop diuretics or thiazide diuretics. Loop diuretics, thiazide, and potassium sparing, those are like the big three of the diuretic world that you need to know, but there is one more that is still important. So let's go jump and talk about that one. Those were the big three, um, but I wanted to talk about osmotic diuretics too. Mannitol is the one that we use, and it's important. It's not used as commonly as the other ones, but this is still important, so I wanted to discuss it. So what this actually does is it decreases intracranial pressure and interocular pressure. It increases serum osmolality, which then pulls the fluid in the body back into the vascular and extravascular spaces. So this is a good thing. So this is used for people who are having, you know, like cerebral edema or something really scary like that. Okay. This is not the everyday, take this at home. We're going to control your blood pressure kind of thing. Okay. So some side effects, very, very scary side effects with this one. Heart failure, pulmonary edema, and kidney failure. The most commonly used one, or I shouldn't say that, the one that we use, um, is called Manitol. Our nursing interventions, we're going to assess for dyspnea, weakness, our JVD, our jugular vein distension, so when your neck veins are popping out, um, and then weight gain, because those are all signs of heart failure, right? Um, we're going to be monitoring their INO, and then we're going to monitoring their labs. So all of their fluids and electrolytes, but also specifically for this one, we want to make sure we're checking out their BUN and their creatinine because again, at risk for kidney failure with this one. So this one's a little bit special, so it has some specific uses, so I put them on the board here. If your patient is in hypovolemic shock, this can be used to help prevent renal failure. If your patient has an increased intracranial or interocular pressure, this could be used to help decrease that. And then if your patient has acute kidney injury or acute renal disease, renal failure, whatever you want to call it, and they're in the acute stage, there's different phases of that. So this medication would be given during the auguric phase of acute kidney injury. So that one was a little bit special, a little bit different, not one of the big three, but still a diuretic nonetheless. So I know we talked about four different types of diuretics and it's probably swirling all around in your brain right now. The big takeaways. The loop diuretics, the thiazide diuretics, they do very similar things. They just work in different parts of the body. Potassium sparing diuretics, because they are potassium sparing, they are at high risk for hyperkalemia, so too much potassium in the body. And then osmotic diuretics, they're the special ones, okay? The ones we only give in the hospital via IV. They're not being on these at home, taking them every day, okay? And this is for like serious, serious stuff. So I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you can tell them all apart. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, let me know. I'll see you on the next one.